and program on Ava Verna 24 is classified MA. It is intended for adults and may be unsuitable for children under 17. It may contain crude and decent language, explicit sexual activity, graphic violence, or political ideology. Viewer discretion is strictly advised. The following program contains opinions of the participants and does not reflect the views and beliefs of the Verna Media Network. The network believes in a safe space for all ideas to be expressed without any censorship and on its duty to create such a platform for free speech. Viewer discretion is strictly advised. Happy New Year! Tonight, we begin another year with hopes and aspirations, with a sincere wish for the nation to grow and for our misery to end. But how can we do that? Are we going to do the same thing over and over again that got us to this point? Or are we going to think new, think fresh, think Sri Lankan? The year 2022 was a year that redefined Sri Lankan society. But did it do so by putting us on the right track towards prosperity? Do we even know the right track even if we see it? So many questions and very few answers. To make sense of it, tonight I'm joined by the former director of the Government Information Department, senior journalist Mohan Samarnaika, and the chairman of SLT Mobitel, Rohan Fernando. Good evening, I'm Mahesh Johnny. And this is the State of the Nation. Happy New Year, and I wish you a prosperous and a productive 2023. Let's hope, as a nation, that Sri Lanka will at least get on the proper track towards prosperity this year. Now, tonight, there's a lot to discuss first. However, I don't want to begin the year complaining because we all know that as a nation we have been complaining all the time. Very little work and a whole lot of nagging. Well, 2022 was many firsts for us as a nation. At the beginning of last year, unfortunately, some groups with many nefarious agendas managed to piggyback on the people's anger that arose due to inaction by the people who were supposed to govern this country. And those groups used that anger for their benefit. They promised us that the usual way of this country uh, is governed would change. They also promised that uh, corruption would be eradicated in this new system and that accountability would be the rule of the land for the people who govern the nation from that point onwards. Ultimately, all their promises to the nation evaporated just like their worthless lives. In the end, a man who has been Wishing and hoping and thinking and praying, planning and dreaming each night of his life for over 50 years got a lottery ticket to be this nation's president. Let's ask the obvious question. The same question I asked a few months back that brought a backlash from the ra radical Neanderthal Colombo liberals. What did the protest in Colombo achieve? Change? A different way of governance? A different political system? At least a different modus operandi? The only thing in my opinion that happened for sure was that the YouTubers who portrayed themselves as activists and the social media fakes who got their advice from the American ambassador in order to get America's agenda in place, now they became richer because they were pumped enough money by those groups who had been carefully watching to destroy Sri Lanka since 2009, from the very first day we won the war. We lost billions of dollars in tourism during that period, the dollars we desperately needed. We lost the confidence of the entire world and were labeled as a nation that does not honor its word. America successfully interfered with our internal politics through the current ambassador, Julie Chung, who acted as uh, Sri Lanka's de facto president when former President Gotabi Rajpaksa was not bothered to govern the country. Everything we said became true. The protests proved to be another scheme to make some people more prosperous and you and me even poorer. 
2022 will go down in history as a year where a president who was elected by the highest number of votes and given the two-thirds majority in parliament abandoned his post and wasn't bothered to do his job while spitting on the face of 6.9 million people altogether. It will also be remembered when a new president was appointed through the parliamentary system and not through the public vote. In history books, 2022 will be etched as the year our economy crashed and later the default of Sri Lanka under the guidance of the current governor of the central bank. We also now know we were once again fooled by a new set of people. It was also a year when politicians learned that you will get booted instantly if you don't do your job. All right, that's 2022. What do we have to do in 2023? We got to fix all that. You and I do not have the luxury of jetting off to Wonderland as the Colombo liberals do right now, when things don't work here. We have to fix this for the betterment of our lives. Let's forget about the future generation, which is the thing that everybody say we have to do everything for, uh, you know, for our children. Let's at least fix it for us if the future generation has any chance of surviving. The economy will be the dominating factor. Right now, IMF is like the saving grace. However, with the implementation of specific requests by the IMF, things will be bad for you and me in the coming days. You will witness that. We all know that with the economic crashing, our buying power half, meaning that your money doesn't have the same capacity to purchase as how it was. We need to change our economy from an importing one to a manufacturing one. We must learn from countries like China, South Korea, Bangladesh, Vietnam, Singapore, Malaysia. There's no other way. For 75 years, we have been engaging in lavish behavior through borrowings. Basically, Nayatakala Sapatahitia. Now the bill is due. So we got to raise money internally with various methods to ensure we pay those dues. I don't think the current government has any idea how to get us there, especially the economic minds at the top, because all of the presented proposals looks a lot like a broken record that has been played in a loop for many years. I see a lot of more of the same rather than change. If the political setup is broken, if the political ideology is faulty, and if the political system is not supporting or working for us, then should we continue to keep hopes in that? Or should we all, as a nation, think differently to get us out of this crisis? Sri Lanka's DNA is as such that we get fooled. From the time of Kuwaiti, we were fooled. When the Portuguese came here uh, to our shows, saying that, you know, they're here to do business and not to colonize. We believed it and later found out that we were fooled. When the Brits came saying they would help to get rid of the Dutch, we were once again fooled. Every single time after an election, like a prayer, we say we were fooled. In this instance, we see various other countries getting closer to us for, the, for their benefit and not to give a damn about us. And sadly, again, it looks like we've been fooled. We fool ourselves into believing that they are here to help. At least, let's aim to stop being fooled in the new year. Let's leave the fooling in 2022. Let 2023 be a year of solutions. I will be right back. Welcome back everyone to the State of the Nation. Well, we need to know where we are right now as a nation and where, how we got here. Um, 
in terms of our economy, in terms of our politics, where is Sri Lanka right now? Well, Dani Dubitana Vasan uh, joins me uh, from the data board. He's at the data board right now. And uh, Dani, good to see you after a very long time uh, on this show. Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you too as well, Mahesh. Um, just to reminisce the past because that's something we do. Uh, this is a special day because this was about, I think, four years back. This was the very day that we met for the first time as well. And this studio is now uh, celebrating its fourth year, if I'm not mistaken. You're talking about Studio 24 and, studio 24, yeah. and the uh, opening of stu uh, Studio 24 back in 2019. Yes, uh, I think you were here to interview me. You were uh, on, our, on our other uh, channel, Pulse, and uh, you were here to interview me right here in the studio. Um, yeah, I mean, <laughs> good to know that. Yeah. But uh, let's get yeah. to the let's things to that the we have yeah. Yeah. right yeah. now. Uh, in terms of our economy, uh, where do we stand? Like, uh, we know things are not that good, and we understand, uh, you know, there's a lot to do in terms of fixing our economy. Lots of uh, reforms need to be brought into uh, this uh, fact. Where are we right now? Yes, Mahesh, so I'm going to look at two things here on the data board, and then we will go into a package of how we got here very quickly. Now, here, what I wanted to really highlight was we, the two aspects that I'm looking at is one, the inflation, and secondly, the contraction of the economy that we are going to look at from the angle of the GDP. Now, all the data that I'll be presenting to you today will be from the Department of Census and Statistics. Now, here, what, we, what I wanted to point out was a 65% headline inflation is what we are witnessing right now, which which the Department uh, of Census and Statistics looked at all provinces, all nine provinces. The National Consumer Price Index is formed by looking at the prices of commodities in all of the nine provinces. And they come up with the figure of 65 to 70 percent within the past two months. These are extremely high figures compared to what it was maybe a few months back. Now, in, 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 keeping, in keeping that in mind, we need to look at the, the general drop that we see just in the previous month. One would say this is a positive outlook looking at going into 2023, but we should bear in mind still having a headline inflation of 65%. I think if you look at the commodity prices which the central bank re releases on a daily basis, it's quite high. One final thing that I want to point out here, Mahesh, is the gradual drop we are witnessing within our GDP. Now, the GDP, just to give a breakdown, is the overall look of the product of services and uh, the other products that have been produced in the country. If we are seeing a drop, we are seeing a drop because of the primary reason of this extreme taxation. And that taxation is contracting our economy, which is harmful. A lot of things that we can look at when looking at how we got here in 2022. As Sri Lanka looks to have a more positive year in 2023, the run-up hasn't been encouraging, particularly when considering the global indicators, which have had a sceptical outlook of the country from the very beginning. On the 1st of December 2022, Fitch Ratings made an announcement that has gone almost unnoticed by many economic pundits, which is the downgrade of Sri Lanka's long-term local currency issuer default rating to double C. This states that a local currency debt default is probable. A local currency debt default would be fatal to Sri Lanka's growth, specifically during a time of recovery. This, coupled with the high pressure through recommendations of the IMF put on the SME sector within our country, provides two of the key challenges we will have to face in the year 2023. Another key issue that has come about in the last few weeks of the year 2022 is the conversation on coal imports and a potential power crisis being regenerated. The state-run Ceylon Electricity Board expects to get 38 coal ships containing 60,000 metric tons of coal by April 15, 2023, five of which has already arrived filling the quota required till the 31st of December 2022. In addition to this, Sri Lanka can look more positively towards other commodity prices in 2023. According to the latest commodity market outlook data by the World Bank, it is suggested that there would be 11% decline in energy prices in the year 2023. The budget, which has been a key talking point within the discussions with the IMF, has given its primary attention to hiking taxes and the reformation of SOEs. This is to meet the purpose of receiving 2.9 billion US dollars in funding from the IMF. The key criteria which has been proposed by the IMF for this regard is reaching a consensus on debt restructuring, with Sri Lanka's lenders ensuring a 2.3% primary balance of GDP by the financial year 2025. The budget aims at increasing government revenue in the short term to 15% of the GDP and securing 8 billion US dollars in FDIs by 2023. To reach these targets, massive tax hikes are witnessed on small and medium enterprises, whose gains or profits will be taxed at 30%, as opposed to the 14% rate currently present. In this backdrop, Sri Lanka has made important strides in how it approaches the export and tourism industry. 
Chairman of the Sri Lanka Tea Board, Niraj Dimil, has claimed that Sri Lanka is targeting export revenues of 1.5 billion US dollars from tea in 2023 and 1.2 billion US dollars in 2022. The Export Development Board has highlighted that the early months of 2023 will be tough given the global issues such as the Ukraine-Russia conflict. The Ministry of Investment Promotion declared in December of last year that Sri Lanka will be expecting 19 billion US dollars in revenue for the year 2023. Tourist arrivals did not reach the expected targets in 2022 and ended at little little over 700,000 arrivals. The Sri Lanka Tourism Development Authority expects between 1.2 million to 1.7 million tourist arrivals in the year 2023. The highest number of tourist arrivals was recorded in 2018, which was 2.3 million. In understanding the situation of the most powerful economies in the world, last week a report by Goldman Sachs predicted that by 2035, China will overtake the US as the world's largest economy. Sri Lanka needs to be mindful, as Mahesh you point out very well within our podcast, mindful of the approach that we are giving specifically in this time period where amongst a lot of factors geopolitics is playing a key role primarily because of the russia ukraine issue and how the other countries are forming themselves around that but we seem to be a little bit silent on it i believe we can talk about this and you will present a lot about this within the state of the nation program over to you mahesh indeed uh, the geopolitics aspect is something we really need to uh, think uh, about uh, because a lot of people seem to think that uh, there were no external factors uh, coming into our country, especially during the past year, um, that I think, like you just mentioned, we need to do a special program on that uh, alone. That is the time of some of the data board. Thank you very much. Let's take a short uh, commercial break. This is State of the Nation. Back in a moment. Welcome back everyone, this is the State of the Nation. If you thought uh, that the tough times for this nation were just last year, buckle up, I have bad news for you. Unfortunately, it'll get worse before it gets better. But in a way, despite the doom and gloom predicted, honestly, I see a year of opportunities in 2023. We now have the unique opportunity to redefine this nation's story. We can change the trajectory because for most of us, we've hit rock bottom. There is no way but up. Last year, the country needed around $8 billion to stay afloat. Now, are you telling me that the top tier businessmen in this country couldn't help find that amount? Really? That's how poor we are? The Sri Lankan business community has a unique opportunity here, actually, to be the saving grace of this nation. Rather than getting a foreign lending agency that's geared towards keeping us poor and miserable, the business community can come up and give this nation the kick it needs to transform from a nation of dependency to independency. Well, joining me now is the chairman of SLT Mobitel, Rohan Fernando. Thank you very much uh, for joining me, sir, um, on this first program on 2023. Happy New Year to you. Uh, now, 2022 was a year of many challenges for Sri Lanka, especially the business community. We took a massive economic hit uh, that was catapulted by the protests. And sadly, in the end, we did not see the promised results. So how did you see 2023 working out? Is there a light at the end of the tunnel or is it more bad news? Thank you, Mahesh, for inviting me for your program. And I also wish you a happy new year. Uh, answering your question, sometimes I wonder whether it was a people struggle or a regime change instrumented by outside forces. Whatever it is, it's all history now and we are back to square one. And I can't see any improvement that has arisen other than uh, all the basic essential items uh, available at a much higher price. So people are still in the same place struggling without uh, uh, light at the end of the tunnel. Now, uh, going forward, I believe 2023 can only be better than 2022 because 2022 has been the 
watershed year in the history of Sri Lanka where we have never seen such situations uh, in our lifetime. So I believe 2023 holds much hope for the people if they believe that they are the people who have to make the change and not look to the politicians, the clergy or the so-called professionals to lead us. I think each one of us have a role to play. Uh, austerity measures, uh, being productive and also like the late uh, John F. Kennedy mentioned, ask what you can do for your country and don't ask what the country can do for you. If we can come to that level, all citizens, we can make this country prosperous again. Indeed, uh, Mr. Fernando, you work in an industry where uh, connecting people is the utmost priority. I understand you deal with many investors worldwide. What is the sentiment out there? What are the challenges uh, we face in attracting uh, new money to this island? You know, my Sri Lanka has a lot of potential. Now look at the, uh, the new uh, financial hub or the port city and our tourism and our marine resources then our mineral resources. All these are potential for uh, foreign investors, but there's a question, how safe their investments are? How stable our policies? Governments change, policies change. And then the political interference at the highest level. So these are the issues that have, you know, the uh, a block on the investment from big corporates. Of course, there are smaller times wheeler dealers coming into the country to make a quick buck and get out. But we need big corporates from the from US, from Europe, from Japan, Korea. There are a lot of corporates where we can have uh, good businesses with investment coming into the country if the systems are in proper place. One other thing is a carriage of justice. We have a good legal system. I don't have any grouse on that. But the carriage of justice, the delays in uh, dealing with legal cases is also a matter of contention for a foreign investor. So I think these are the few things that we need to do, system change, tweak, then we can see big corporates coming into the country. Absolutely, uh, Mr. Fernando, uh, what you say, said makes sense. Now, I, I do want to uh, pick your brain on another matter. One of the things that we see right now is an influx of young minds leaving Sri Lanka, seeking better employment opportunities overseas. Uh, as a result, Sri Lanka will suffer due to this brain drain. Now, in your opinion, how do we address this? You see, this brain drain is happening all over the world, not only in Sri Lanka. You are now you have access to information, access to travel, so people start migrating. At the same time, don't forget, there are 700,000 people from outside who are living, uh, Sri Lankan living outside has applied for dual citizenship, the Sri Lankan passport. So I think these are also, this is also a you know, positive thing I look at. The fact is, in Sri Lanka, a lot of people are unaware of what they can do. Now look at our uh, uh, education system. Does it ready our people for the new technology, the future? And futuristic jobs, no. Except in the IT sector, most of the graduates coming out are uh, all art-centric gradu graduates. So there's a pressure on the government, pressure on the, the job market. Technically, I believe there is a shortage of labor in this country. So there, is, there are opportunities only if they right, select the right job and, uh, and if they want to work hard. And now, if you look at Facebook, they laid off thousands of people. So that is also a different way of brain drain or retrenching. It's happening all over the world, especially in a global meltdown in economy, these things happen. Uh, but we should not get too alarmed, but we need to find new opportunities, new ventures to retain our people and give them the confidence that Sri Lanka is ready for business. Absolutely. Uh, Mr. Fernando, IMF uh, seems to be uh, what liberal economic uh, think tanks have proposed uh, as uh, our saving grace and now we have uh, 
gone and it is at the tail end of that entire process. However, we only get around $2.9 billion as a part of the bailout deal. Uh, as a person heading a blue chip company in Sri Lanka, will this make an impact and would it put us on the track towards recovery? I doubt very much. This is the 17th time we are going to IMF. You know, the Einstein has said if you do the same thing over and over again and ex expect a different result, you have to be a lunatic. It's called lunacy. Aren't we doing the same thing? There are so many things we can do to restructure our economy, restructure our public institutions and clean the system, clean the decks. Un unless and until we do that, IMF or World Bank, anybody coming into the country will only be just a the plaster work and 2.9 billion is hardly any money for us to come out of this mess. Of course, now we have gone into the default state. Now we can work on bilateral investments from with India, China, Japan, Korea. These are the countries that will probably help us to come out of this, but not with loans, but with investment. Some of our large-scale uh, loss-making state-owned enterprises can be restructured for investment. That's what I feel. Not to sell our assets, but to restructure for investments. So if you do the restructuring investment, then what will happen is money will come into the country, new technology will come into the country, and the country can gradually come out of this debt trap. There is no point borrowing money to pay debt. This is what has been happening, I think, since 1980s. This is what has been happening. We borrow to pay for the previous borrowings and it continues. And we are very happy if we can bring the budget deficit to 85 to 9%. But where are we going to end? Every time when the economy expands, the 85% also expands. And then this is a never-ending problem for us. But if we can get real-term investments into the country by restructuring our systems, I think that is the way forward. IMF is probably will give a uh, like some sort of a comfort zone for others to think uh, IMF has cleared the system, but I have very little hope on that. Absolutely. Uh, Mr. Fernando, in this entire conversation of economic recovery and IMF uh, debt restructuring is essential. Um, we are in talks with our external debt holders and uh, there is a word about local debt restructuring. Is that a prudent move to restructure uh, locally? I think when you are restructuring debt, you have to restructure debt all over. Otherwise, if you don't restructure the local debt, how will the foreign, uh, uh, you know, uh, the lender have confidence? But it has to be approached cautiously and with a with a proper strategy more than the i think what is lacking in this country is our overbearing public service this has to be restructured now you should take uh, the large scale money that has to be pumped out of the treasury now i saw in the papers the treasury secretary saying he does the collection tax collection is not sufficient even to pay the pensioners because every year, more and more pensioners get added to the system. The tax, the salary bill increases. So until and unless you resolve those issues of wastage in the public sector, whatever the money comes may not be sufficient. So even the debt restructuring will become a burden to us today, tomorrow and the years to come. So we need to find the root cause and clear those. I feel uh, the same people are doing the same thing over and over again and giving a, a bogus comfort zone to the people by supplying the gas on time, fuel on time and all the others on time. But look at the problem we have, most of our essentials which can be produced in Sri Lanka are imported. We have to wait for the gas ship to come, we have to wait for the oil ship to come, we have to wait for the fertilizer ship to come, powdered milk ship to come, then chemical ships to come, we are all dependent. And some of our uh, food items which we used to produce in the past, we are importing. So we have to first get into the basics 
I mean, this is a country uh, which boasted, boasted of uh, Dasamaha Yodhyas during Kim uh, Dutagamanu's time. They didn't eat hamburgers and pizzas to become the Dasamaha Yodhyas. Sri Lanka had, Sri Lanka had, Sri Lanka has proper nutrient products. If you look at the protein intake of this country, we have enough fish resources, we have milk resources. Then we have vegetable proteins in coconut milk and soya milk. Why aren't we making these products freely available? That will be the answer to child malnutrition, if they are talking about malnutrition. And, and that way we can even become a net exporter of these items to the world. Our fish resources are hardly utilized. I think most of the foreign countries come into the Indian Ocean and catch our fish resources. So these are the things such in the government, the think tanks must concentrate on, uh, you know, harnessing for the greater benefit of our country. Absolutely. Uh, very quickly, Mr. Fnado, in 2023, what are the top three things the government must focus on towards economic recovery? Number one, they must have proper rules and regulations to stop corruption from top to bottom. This is, the, this is one major area where Sri Lanka has fallen way below the required amount. And number two, they must cut down on government expenditure. And the people who are supposed to be people's representatives must first make the sacrifices, get out of these uh, uh, the vehicle permits, get out of all unnecessary uh, frills, and then show uh, car shows, all those things, they have to cut down on the expenses. And number three, they must reform education, they must reform judicial system so that people get a proper education and not free but for a fee and have only a safety net for the poorest of the poor at the lowest strata in society. And our company, SLT, has offered to do this uh, uh, digital identification system. But I, I see very little, uh, you know, initiative from the government officials to implement these digital systems. Through digitalization, a lot of these corruptions can be avoided. But unless the decision makers want this done, I can't see these things happening in this country. All right, we have to leave it at that. Thank you very much, sir, for your time on this New Year's Day. Uh, that was Mr. Rohan Fernando, the chairman of uh, SLT Morbidale. I will take a uh, small commercial break and be right back. This is Ted Bush. Welcome back everyone, this is the State of the Nation. So what's in store for us in 2023? Well, that's a question we are desperately looking uh, for answers to. Now, earlier we spoke about the economic challenge we might face in the new year. The political sentiment continues to dominate this nation's path and how exactly can we proceed towards a prosperous country that benefits all of us? For that, I'm now joined by uh, senior journalist Mohan Samaranaika. He was also the Director General of the Government Information Department. Thank you very much, uh, sir, for joining us and Happy New Year to you. Mr. Samaranaika, uh, you were on my program at the beginning of 2022 and uh, we were very optimistic that Sri Lanka would recover from the COVID uh, economic crisis. Now still, alas, the current economic crisis took precedent and here we are in the midst of a new set of problems. What is your analysis for 2023? First, Mahesh, I must thank you for your invitation to take part in this program. And regarding the path that we should take during the year 2023, my view is that my firm view is that we need to have a correct scientific and objective assessment of what went wrong. 
I am telling that because we do not have even uh, even a near consensus as to what has gone wrong. My opinion is that the basic fundamental mistake that we did was we followed uh, an economic model imposed by the former imperialist con countries and present hegemonic countries. Blindly we followed this uh, economic model. That's an economic model which is not sustainable, which we cannot afford. Under this economic model, we believed Western development model is the one and only econ economic model to follow. Therefore, we blindly follow this wrong path. Now we are in an unprecedented economic and political, social and cultural uh, crisis as well. So in the first place, we need to have an analysis of what has gone wrong. Indeed. Uh, now, Mr. Samaranke, in, in terms of politics, we don't see the usual political model anymore. So is politics being redefined for the better? Mahesh, I don't think that politics is redefined for the better at the moment. That is because now if you take for example, what I said in uh, in response to your first question, what has gone wrong? So many people believe, uh, mostly the major opposition parties believe, the only fault was the corruption and theft committed during the Rajapaksa regime. That may be a factor, but that is not the real reason for after independence, there were certain governments, especially under SLFP. What SLFP now is doing, I don't agree with them at all. But under SLFP governments, there was an attempt to build our own production economy. Mahesh, my, to my understanding, according to what I have studied, nowhere in the world that a country has reached a considerable level of economic development without developing their own potential, own res utilizing their own resources and having a national uh, production economy. So that is the reason as I see, therefore I, I cannot uh, ad, um, ad, um, agree with the statement that the politics is redefined at present for the better. Absolutely. Now, uh, Mr. Samaranayake, in one of the conversations you and I had off camera, we discussed how geopolitics had been a, the catalyst for the instability that we witnessed a few months back. How much of that geopolitical influence would we continue to see in 2023? I think it is one of the crucial decisive factors that has caused this unprecedented crisis. This is not to say that our governments didn't make mistakes. Yes, our governments, even the government of President Gotabe Rajapaksa, which we supported during the campaign, did a lot of mistakes, unwise decisions, arbitrary decisions, uh, and wrong decisions. But in addition to these uh, mistakes, yes, geopolitics played a crucial ro uh, role in this crisis. I can give you several examples. For example, now there is an undeclared cold war is brewing, especially on the part of the uh, hegemonic rich countries led by the United States and NATO. On the other hand, Russia and China. Really, China is the main target of the uh, developed countries because they want to contain China's rise. That, that plays a crucial role in this crisis. For, that is because of the look, significance, importance of the strategic and geopolitical uh, and commercial uh, look, uh, importance of the loc location of Sri Lanka. Absolutely. Um, I, I really hope that Sri Lankans would wake up and understand this, this uh, interference by foreign, foreign powers uh, within our country. Mr. Samaranagana, former President Mahind Rajpaksa, was very close with China. Not only him, but uh, former Prime Minister Sirimao Bandaranaika was another leader with a very tight relationship with China, which translated towards practical economic support. However, right now, amidst a severe crisis, we turn towards the West and in return, turn away from China. 
Is that the case? And if that is the case, is it a wise decision? That is one of the reasons I believe China has been an all-weather friend right from the beginning. Even at a time we didn't have diplomatic relations with China, China came to our help after the end of the Korean uh, War. So China has been helping Sri Lanka consistently without interfering into our internal political affairs. At all international fora, China uh, stood uh, with Sri Lanka during the crisis LTTE war and after that when the UN Human Rights Council began to punish Sri Lanka, adopting several re resolutions, China was in the forefront of countries which helped us. Therefore, I think to be uh, friendly with China, to seek its uh, assistance is a wise decision. This is not to say that China doesn't have its own agenda. Yes, it does. But at the same time, we need, need to understand it was China who, were, who was ready to help us and it was China who had enough surplus capital to invest in other countries. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mohan Samaranaika, senior journalist and former director of the Government Information Department. I appreciate your time. Let's take a short commercial break. I'll be right back. Think about this. For many years, we have been saying Sri Lanka has a long way to go. Even right now, after the crisis we faced, we have been told that every day, every month, every year, all of our focus is on how much we as a nation have to go. But very little focus on how long we came. Since independent, it has only been 75 years of us governing ourselves. Try to figure out what our country should be like. But yes, if you look at countries like South Korea, Singapore, Malaysia, even Bangladesh, they managed to pull their socks up and focus on what was necessary. Most of us have a home of our own. Let's think about how much we do to take care of our home. Irrespective of our income, we do our best to keep our home clean, beautiful and secure. We don't let anyone else invade our homes or allow outside persons to take advantage of our homes. We do everything well to take care of our home. But although we do that to our homes, we don't do the same for our country. Perhaps in the new year, we should strive to think about Sri Lanka as our own home and that we got to do everything we do to secure that home and make it better. This crisis is a unique opportunity for all of us to begin anew. Like Winston Churchill once said, don't let a good crisis go to waste. Let us not sit around complaining. Let us get to work and build a more secure, more stable, more happier home for all of us living here. I know most of us are talking about reforms in all sectors of our society, our economy, our politics, our governance. But in my opinion, the only reforms that are needed right now are in the minds of Sri Lankans. To reform it to a point they really care about this country. That's State of the Nation uh, for tonight. I appreciate uh, you spending time this Sunday night with me, this New Year's Day. Also, don't forget to check us out on our podcast available on Spotify and Apple Podcast, released weekly. You will actually find it very interesting. I'm Mahish Johnny from all of us here at Adadarana 24. Happy New Year and have a good night. I'll see you next week. <laughs>